can't hold on to your little balloon. I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to go fight, you know, Mysterio. Yeah. So, this is not my problem. Um, and then she turns into a super villain. This week on Backward Compatible, Nick Kruger joins Jim, Doc, and Chris to discuss the pros and cons of different branching dialogue systems in video games. Plus, Planet Coaster, City Skylines, Outlive, a look ahead to E3, and more. Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 103 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hello, hello. And Nick is joining us today as well. Hello. Uh, Nick is kind of playing our audio engineer, because as you might have noticed, we uh, have upgraded our sound quality. Uh, We're coming up on uh, three years of Backward Compatible. You might recall that we started our first episode reviewing uh, E3 2014, and we're coming up on E3 2017 at the time of recording. Uh, And so kind of this is a a three-year birthday gift to the podcast and to you, our listeners. We have saved up a little bit and bought uh, some new mics. And so now we all sound good. Yeah, I'm ruining my frame (laughs) about this new sound quality. (laughs) What'd you say? (laughs) I am over here. (laughs) <laughs> but we have an interesting uh, topic of discussion for you today. We're going to be talking about, um, and this might turn into a little bit of a series, how player choice is presented in games, specifically in dialogue. And we're actually going to get a little bit into specific things. Like, for example, how we show them dialogue options. Do you show them entire sentences to let them know exactly what it is they're going to say? Or do you paraphrase? And what are kind of the pros and cons of these different things? Railroad. Railroad everything. <laughs> yes. Uh, and we'll also get a little bit into the implications of different choices Uh, that you'll make design-wise as far as uh, how much freedom do we give the player, how do we sort of guide them into what it is we want them to do while also giving the illusion of choice. Interestingly, this is kind of almost like going back to what we did in our very first episode with the kick the puppy versus kick the kitten. That's exactly what (laughs) kind of, I was thinking about that today and I was like, you know what, That, that I think that's something we could talk about more now, so... I think it'll be interesting. Railroad. Put them both on the railroad. <laughs> oh, it's the trolley problem. We're yeah, back just, on that? Yeah. Right? Put, put both of the puppy and the kitten on separate tracks. <laughs> and then you have to just pull the lever to see which one gets The killed. answer is always the fat man, just if you ever <laughs> yeah. have to take one of those. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did you play the Prey demo? <laughs> yes, I did, actually. <laughs> the one question that has nothing to do with the fat man, one of your choices is push the fat man. Yeah. <laughs> and of course you pick it just to see what they say. Of course. And yeah, and the, the, the guys, the scientists behind the, uh, the screen... They just kind of look at it and go, hmm, interesting. interesting. Push the fat man, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Lately, I've been playing a couple of uh, indie games that are remakes slash spiritual successors to uh, a couple of classic sim games. Uh, the first is uh, Planet Coaster, which is kind of a... Uh, a spiritual successor slash remake of Roller Coaster Tycoon. It's actually made by the same people who made Roller Coaster Tycoon Three, and the. Uh, oh, uh, oh, really? Yeah. Is it the same? Is it actually the same? It's not the same company. It's just it's the not same the designers. Same. Well, I think uh, I think it is the same like dev team, uh, same company, but it was published by like a different publisher. They did Roller Coaster Tycoon Three specifically, right? Yeah, and they also did the uh, expansion packs for Roller Coaster Tycoon Two. Right, right. And I think it, I think they made a couple other sim games. Like I think they made Zoo Tycoon. Don't quote me on that. Mm-hmm. So in in Planet Coaster is the idea to make a planet of nothing but roller coasters that are all interconnected? Uh, no. Uh, it's just it's no. A, it, I'm afraid not. No. It's like, more like Goat Simulator 2000, <laughs> but without the goats. There was a Goat okay. Simulator 2000. That was in. I no, I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the goat yeah, is made yeah. of liquid metal, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But the uh, it's it's just a park management simulation game uh, akin to Roller Coaster Tycoon, uh, and it's it's interesting because it's kind of just like the next step in the Roller Coaster Tycoon series, except the latest Roller Coaster Tycoon game. Uh, is horrible. It's uh, I haven't played it myself, but I've seen plenty of reviews. It's poorly optimized. It doesn't run well. It's got 
a really weird art style. It's got just really bad design choices overall. Mm. And this indie game that's made by, you know, admittedly the same devs as the other ones that are better, but kind of taking the taking the spotlight, so to speak. And the second game I was going to mention, which is uh, Cities Skylines. Uh, that's a SimCity-esque game made by uh, a completely different studio, not related to Maxis or SimCity at all. Um, it's made by Colossal Order, which made uh, the indie game uh, Cities in Motion uh, 1 and 2. So they have some experience with uh, you know that sort of thing, but they're not... Um, they're not a huge studio like the other one. And Cities in Motion was specifically, it had to do a lot with transit and stuff like that. So yeah. it wasn't so much full city management, just sort of. Yeah. And Cities in Motion, at least the first one, I'm not familiar with the second one, but you couldn't even place roads. It was more about uh, making like train lines and stuff like that. Gotcha, and bus yeah. lines. Mm-hmm. Um, but with, with City Skylines, uh, it's interesting because this actually came out in 2015, I believe. Uh, it it was kind of a direct response to SimCity 2013 in that it looks almost identical in terms of gameplay, except it basically did everything that SimCity thir- 2013 did wrong, and it ch- changed all that and did it right, quote unquote. Um, I think it succeeded, but you know that's up to you to decide if you play the game. Um, cities cities uh, SimCity 2013 had uh, like an extreme limitation on the size of your city. Like I think it was like three kilometers square was like the biggest size you could do for your city so they completely removed that limitation but even if you play the games like side by side you know they they look almost identical you've got the same sort of road drawing tools you've got the same uh like rci demand system with the same colors even like the aesthetic of like graphic overlays looks almost exactly the same um and for those who don't know rci is residential commercial industrial right yeah it's it's how you draw like that's how you zone your city Mm -hmm. um so they've got all the same color schemes and everything. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting because like if you, if you didn't know better, you would think that Cities Skylines was literally just SimCity 2013 mm. if you looked at them at like first glance. Um, so it's, it's interesting. And that's, that's a very comparatively small studio. They just published on Steam. They didn't do a big, uh, you know, they weren't the same team behind uh, you know, an earlier SimCity game. They were just completely unrelated. Mm-hmm. And they kind of copied the game mm-hmm. almost almost to a, uh, you know, is this is this legal mm-hmm. sort of thing? I mean, it uh, clearly is because it's been out for however many years now. Mm-hmm. But Yeah, it almost it almost reminds me of um, back in the arcade day, arcade heyday of the nine of the 80s and 90s, where especially the 80s, where they would take a popular game and just make multiple knockoff versions of it mm-hmm. to try to so they could get all the profits from it. So like for example Donkey Kong there were a bunch of knockoff versions of Donkey Kong. Like one of them was called Crazy Kong, for example. <laughs> so um Pac-Man, I mean the most famous copy of Pac-Man being Ms. Pac-Man, which was, you know, designed uh by an offshoot studio. I think I think Midway did Ms. Pac-Man. Namco was responsible for Pac-Man. That sounds right. And uh Ms. Pac-Man is Sort of in this similar situation, Nick, um, is usually regarded by most fans of maze games as being the superior version. Yeah, um, this definitely is the superior version of SimCity. Mm. But if you've seen the cartoon, both are canon. That's true. Yeah, and they also have a little uh, baby, a Pac baby. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> when is Pac baby coming out? Uh, it did. There, oh, really? there, there was, there was, there was a Super Pac Man. There was a was it? I don't think it was called Pac Baby. No, it was called Pac Pac Man Junior. Pac Man Junior, uh-huh. yeah, or Pac Junior, or something like that. Um, but oh, yeah, no, there was a baby like Pac-Man. Pac-Man. There was there <laughs> there was a whole bunch of Pac. There's a whole line of games, but a lot of knockoffs, a lot of knockoffs too. So yeah. I don't know, and, and maybe it's also because now the game design space has become open. Before you couldn't like if I wanted to design even a simplistic game, I couldn't do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I couldn't. I I physically couldn't do it. Now it doesn't really take that much knowledge. I mean, it takes some to make a really simplistic game because we have tools like unity that make things relatively simple now Mm -hmm. i may not be able to make a good game if i didn't have more understanding and knowledge and new things like programming and art and that kind of thing um but i could still make something and getting that information is actually easier now too because we have the internet you we have all this information out there on the internet for free and of course you could actually actually go to amazon and buy a book well everything read a book everything you just described is exactly how zynga built its empire and quite, quite literally, um, the legal costs of buying the original property off in settlement 
was actually part of their whole model. Um, and I don't say that to be mean. I, it's just that there there were knockoffs. Like before Farmville, there was that other one that no one remembers. And then they took it and made it better. And Farmville was the great thing. Mm. So yeah, it's it's valid. Yeah, and it's interesting because this is something that's coming out of the indie space, and it's not like a big AAA company uh, copying a EA published game. I, I wonder what the reaction would have been like if you know some other big company with a big studio budget backing the studio uh, had published a game that looked almost identical to what Maxis did with SimCity 2013. I wonder uh, what the legality, legal situation would have been there and whether or not it had been shut down. Because there, I mean, to be fair, there there are enough differences between City Skylines and SimCity 2013 that it's not just a straight up copyright violation. Yeah, they, they get into some weird stuff there with like, say, patent law, where, for example, like all you need to do for a patent to be valid is have enough of a change or enough of an improvement to be able to say that it's not the same thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's been pretty conclusively ruled that you cannot patent rules to games. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. In other words, the, the game mechanics of a game cannot be... Um, mm-hmm. And so it's really, you know, copywritten or, or, or otherwise patented. But the code itself can be. Yes. yes so that's why, going back to Donkey Kong that we mentioned before, um, Nintendo had that whole situation where the actual code that they, like they, they had somehow licensed out the original Donkey Kong cabinet mm-hmm. to the point where that it's kind of in legal limbo right now in terms of who owns it. Nintendo doesn't technically Still? own it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, but, and then, and it, they own, that's why anytime you see um, a version of Donkey Kong re-released, it's always the NES version and not the arcade version. It's for that reason. So yeah, but you're right. Like you could have a whole bunch of knockoffs to that game and that's perfectly legal. But the actual code itself, even though Nintendo, it was Nintendo's property and they own the Donkey Kong character, they don't own that code because someone else made the code. Original character, code. do not steal. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, it's true, a gi- actually. He's a giant monkey. Come yeah, on. except they actually have like a legal precedent to say that. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Grab your salt shakers, because it's time for some reckless speculation. Arcs used to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. As Chris mentioned before, E3 is coming up, mm-hmm. and I'd like to talk just a little bit about um, what might happen at E3 and do a little bit of reckless speculation. We're one of those gaming podcasts that doesn't really do the whole, um, man, E3 is here and it's like the biggest event of the year, and we're going to be doing like previews and live coverage and then like post coverage and analysis. Mostly we, because we don't have the budget for that. <laughs> well, that too. It's but. a week long commercial. <laughs> it's because we don't like Mountain Dew. That's the real. That's the real thing. I we're love not, Mountain Dew. We're not legitimate. We're not a legitimate gaming podcast because we don't chug Mountain Dew. Mm. Well, I just, I'm just waiting for a Mountain Dew sponsorship. If they'll send us a case, <laughs> I'll, I'll drink it live on air on this re- pre-recorded podcast. <laughs> yeah, now that we've got the mics all close up, we can get like the gulping sounds and everything. <laughs> yeah. <there you> go. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, it, do we have? I, I guess the reckless speculation here is going to be talking about. Do we have any sort of predictions for E three or uh, anything that we think will or won't be announced? Because I'm not really following it too closely. Like my my E three has always been. I'll check out the Nintendo stuff and then probably through the grapevine hear about anything else that's worth knowing about. But I never watch most of the press conferences. So, so this year, um, I'm a little disappointed because all the games that I've heard that they might talk about, very few of them interest me at all. So I, I feel a little bit left out. Um, Nintendo is planned to show Super Mario Odyssey, mm-hmm. which more of it, I certainly am interested in seeing. But otherwise, I don't know what else they're going to show. Right. Um, they might, hopefully they'll show something new. So I'm going to go ahead and recklessly speculate that, that um, we're going to get some sort of talk of Super Smash Brothers. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, not necessarily they're going to they're gonna say, oh, it's going to come out soon. Mm-hmm. But I feel like because of how big the game is, they're either going to announce that there's going to be some sort of a DX version that mm-hmm. they're going to take the Wii U and port it over. Or another thing that I've heard, and I, and I think this might actually happen, they might re-release the um, Super Smash Melee version from GameCube, hmm. which is still used in, in several tournaments, and actually have a version of that on the Switch. Interesting. I, wh- why do you say that? Um, I say that because I think they're they're going to try to ca- like cash in, not necessarily money wise, but yeah. try to try to get into the craze of all of the uh, esports oh, and programmers. Okay. And they know that that 
Super Smash Bros. Melee is their most popular yeah. for that when it comes to pro gamers, the pro yeah, gaming they, scene. They've actually been releasing a lot of games recently. They're moving in that direction. Like they're not Splatoon. Yeah, Splatoon is another Two. Um, Arms is an example. Arms. Yeah, um, and they're they're expected to show more about Ar- mm-hmm. more of Arms too, which Arms is releasing actually in a couple of weeks right yeah yeah it's very very soon i just i think i think nintendo doesn't really have a strong reputation of like appeasing to the core uh hardcore uh smash players though like they've uh i'm not super familiar with the smash community and how uh crazy hardcore they are about the meta and everything i I think they've been pretty responsive to the meta in um the newest one yeah for, for wii u 3ds because they yeah. have namco working on it and they've been releasing a That's lot true. of balance patches and stuff like that yeah, yeah so. I, I think they really have been been doing better in that in that regard so even if it's not going to be a melee port mm-hmm. if it might be something that maybe they're going to have a version of the wii u version that they already have and port it over to switch but yeah. then make some changes that might appeal I, more to the pro gaming base yeah i bet they're going to do the same thing they did with mario kart uh mario kart 8 they're just going to port it over maybe add some new maps maybe change some balancing issues stuff like that mm. i don't think they're going to port melee though that's been a while i think as a general trend though was something i'm anticipating seeing at e3 and i'm not sure that this is going to be the case but i expect to see more about ar and vr um ah. I, apple recently at their big event they really emphasized ar on the iphone mm-hmm. um so i think ar is going to be a big push here in the next in the coming years i think that we're probably going to see something from uh microsoft at least if not also sony about ar Mm-hmm. Um, I also think that Sony's going to keep pushing their VR a little yeah, bit. And, right. And since you did mention AR, mm-hmm. um, kind of a related topic, Rare is releasing one of its first games, new properties in a long time. Mm. It's actually a pirate-based um, open-world pirate game. Huh. Hey, more pirates. So, you know, AR, mm-hmm. pirates, R. Okay. And yes. as we know. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say about it. I said, Everything's it. better with pirates. <laughs> so... Yes, exactly. But that, we're, game, we're gonna, that game could be interesting. We're getting uh, Arg the Arg. The Arg, Arg the Arg. Arg, Arg the Arg. <laughs> um, oh, no. No, 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 no. And I, so we might see some more VR. I don't, I'm not so sure about just how much we'll see. We might see mm. something, but it, does, it doesn't feel like VR has gotten the sort of buzz that True, yeah, they I, originally I, anticipated I don't it, it getting. Yeah, I, I should say, I, I expect to see it, but maybe contrary to what I said earlier, I don't think it's going to be like a big thing. I think mm. it'll be something everyone touches on at least, but it's not going to mm. be... Um, the focus of their presentation. So this isn't actually speculation at all. This is confirmed. Mm. Um, this is the first E3 that's actually going to be open to the public. Mm. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of interesting and weird. And not only that, but because of that and related to that, they're, they're actually extending it. Mm. And so they're, um, they're starting a little earlier, kind of already have, and um, going, I think, a little longer too. So my reckless speculation is that we're going to be seeing um, stuff that we haven't seen before because the audience is going to be shifting. We're probably going to have some like um, like players' choice sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, more demos, and, yeah. more something. I mean, we're, we're I, I, I'm imagining there being like an image and there's like 50 chairs, mm-hmm. you know, and, and we've never seen that before. Well, I'll say this. Do y'all know the last time that Rockstar has had ga- a gameplay footage and a booth of their game playable at an E3? Nope. What nope. year that was? 2009. Hmm. Really? So my my reckless speculation is that Red Dead Redemption Two will be playable hmm. ah. at E three. Wow! They're going to have something playable to build buzz and as sort of a a way to give a little bit of something back to the gamers that are disappointed that the that it was pushed an entire year to spring of twenty eighteen. Jim, they gave us a trailer. Come on! But it wasn't a gameplay trailer. Oh, that's true. It was it was pretty much a cinematic trailer. Yeah, I think they're going to have. Point. I think they're going to show a gameplay. Tra- play trailer and people are going to assume that's all it's going to be and then they're going to surprise people and they're going to have a level or a space or some some area playable kind of like how nintendo had um the that that opening plateau Mm -hmm. region playable for breath of the wild it's going to be like that there's going to be a space even though it's an open world game there's going to be a space that's completely playable and open for players and just on a time limit basically yes i think so yeah that'd that'd be cool i could see that happening and i won't be there to play it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm so sad right now. But you can go to Best Buy because we're teaming up with Best Buy. And no, that's Nintendo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, Rockstar will team up with GameStop or something. Who knows? Yeah, oh. <laughs> Please, no. I don't want to go to GameStop. <laughs> team up with Funko Land. They're still around, Funko right? Land. <laughs> no. Just team up with every mom and pop Blockbuster Video. The world. Block- Blockbuster Video. <laughs> Do they still exist? No. Oh, no, they're, they're, they're going to be the thing that revives Blockbuster Video. <laughs> that's it. That's <laughs> we're what it bringing is. it back. Yeah. 
This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So uh, E3 is already one day in. uh, As of the recording, it's Sunday. uh, And yesterday was Saturday. So uh, EA did their big old presentation at E3. Um, And one thing that kind of popped out to me, uh, they they announced Battlefield or Star Wars Battlefront 2 and then some other things, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> big um, news coming out of E3 <laughs> like, but the one thing that popped out to me was actually uh, a game called A Way Out which is a uh, it's developed by the guy who did uh, Brothers A Tale of Two Sons I believe that's what it's called Yeah, which was very well received from what I understand it's yeah. a co-op game yeah, yeah it's a co-op game couch co-op kind of shared screen you're above yeah, yeah. on the screen and we'll, yeah, yeah. Uh, this game is called uh, A Way Out I think I already said that and it's a uh, two player it has to be two player co-op uh, about two guys who are escaping from a prison, I guess. And that's local or online. Local or online. But, but it's, it's always split screen. It's regardless. always split screen, yeah. Oh, so you can play online in this one, right? Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Good. Because I don't have a lot of friends, so I got to find <laughs> some just some rand other like poor sap online somewhere <laughs> yeah. that, will, that also is like, oh, I don't Another have any friends gym. either. <laughs> Let's play together. Yeah. Well, um, well we've got both, we both got PS4, so we'll just have to hop online and we can do a backward compatible run of the game perhaps. Cool. Or we could do that couch be cool. co-op because you guys have been talking about couch co-op a lot. True. Yeah. Especially yeah. last yeah, yeah. year. True, yeah. true. We could get together and we could we could kind of play it together and we mm-hmm. could swap swap off controllers mm-hmm. and but um, that's what we did with the Batman Telltale game. Exactly. Yeah. Except th- this time we might have a good time. <laughs> and, and it's good practice because I already feel like I'm in prison every time we do a recording. So. Yeah. <laughs> Especially now that we got the pop filters look a little bit like, you know, bars. Yeah. You know, oh, we're yeah. Behind, we're behind bars. Behind bars yeah. <laughs> well, I, I did see, uh, we watched just before in preparation for the show. Right. Um, there, was a, there was a video where the, the developer is, is talking about the game, mm-hmm. kind of sharing some of his thoughts and inspirations and uh, with some, some of the gameplay footage. And um, like you pointed out, it being co-op, split screen co-op, it's interesting because I'm assuming that even if you're online, is it still going to be split screen? Yeah. Yeah. So the, so in doing that, it makes it so that you always know what your other player is doing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is interesting. And then the other part of that was um, he mentioned that you have one person can be in a cinematic while the other person can be walking around, walking around, doing yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. So um they have different ways to approach different like i know one of the things they talked about was they had to get uh something from the laundry room they had to like smuggle or, sheets or something yeah, through and, the laundry room right and, and they had so, different ways to do it and they they could do it at different times based on their schedules and yeah, based on and what, one, where they are and one player could do the actual action or the other person could do it and then have somebody else distracting or yeah. vice versa yeah. and i know they they talked about how you you can go around and you can collect you know various ingredients and things from around the yard to make toilet wine inside your cell. <laughs> I missed that part. Not, yeah, not I, actual I think feature. you made that up, Jim. I, I may have made that part up, but let's just let's just say that it would be really cool if they could. You could make your own toilet wine. You could set up a table for two, light some candles, and you and your little co-op buddy can just sit there drinking some table wine, having a really nice, classy dinner. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I'm intrigued by in uh, watching the trailer, it's it's hard to tell because the developer was talking about how they're really like trying to give you this cool narrative experience. You're really going to get to know your characters, both both players will get to know both characters throughout the course of the game i'm wondering how long the game is meant to be because if you're expected to session up with someone and i think ideally the same person um you know is that sort of the thing where like it's supposed to be a 20 hour game and you get together for two hour sessions or is it more like you know you both sit down maybe for something up to four hours and it's more just kind of like this sort of cinematic adventure i'm guessing it's going to be uh four to six hours but it's going to be very replayable so mm-hmm. that you can get a good 30 hours out of it yeah so i, is, I could see that happening. is the idea that you can escape from the prison in a multitude of ways i that's what it seems like from the trailer does okay. anyone know how long brothers was uh i don't know it wasn't very long because mm-hmm. i'm wondering if it's going to be more like that where it's meant to be kind of a a concise co-op experience with right. a lot of depth potentially. Right. Well, the thing about Brothers was it was all on one screen. There was no split screen. Right. And uh, I actually um, took both controllers, like one in each hand, sort of uh, switch style, mm-hmm. and and played it. Huh. So I sort of cheated that, <laughs> but I get the impression you can't do that with this. Man, the advocate for couch co-op is just playing by himself. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, it's because I don't have any friends either, Jim. So, uh. yeah. It's a very depressing they all have episode. Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so if I can recklessly speculate about this game a little bit, uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that at some point there's going to be a big, a big emotional climactic scene 
where the split screens come together for some uh, reason. <laughs> oh, and, and they do one of those bro fists like in, like in Predator, <laughs> yeah. where like they're just slam their hands together and they're flexing their muscles. We, we need hmm. the, uh, uh, if this is, if this works out, we need the Schwarzenegger-esque, um, like 80s action version. That'd be pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, what I'm wondering is, I got the impression, looking at the trailer, um, that if, even if you mess up, it keeps going. And that you don't reload and that sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm really wondering how they're going to handle something. Yeah, it looks that. like they're going for a seamless experience, yeah, which is interesting. Yeah, which is cool. Because one of the iconic moments is you have to jump across this chasm and the other guy has to catch you. And yeah. they, don't, they don't show him catching. <laughs> and so it implies well, you might drop him. Hmm. So what's going to happen if you drop him? Does he die? Is the game over? Or uh, maybe he pulls like, himself back up, but yeah. then yeah, he's like then he's you, stuck down there in the river or something, and he's being chased away. And now you have to go help him see, that, out, or that he could has be to work his really way back. Cool. Mm-hmm. So while we're talking, I did want to. Uh, I feel like we should mention that um, Adam West, as of the day of this recording, he passed away yesterday. And my um, namesake. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, I'm his namesake, I guess. Ah. <laughs> Got to conjugate the verb correctly. Well, at least 50%. Mm. Because, you know, dad says I was named after Batman. Mm. Um, but mom denies it. So, <laughs> I gotcha. you know, it's, it's at least, but, but, you know, when her head was turned away, he would like nod in my direction and be like, yes. Yes, totally. Yes. <laughs> and so she she can use the excuses like it's biblical. Right. But yeah, he was right. like, no, but it's actually Adam West. Yeah, it was, it was actually Adam West. Let's face it, which one's more important here? <laughs> well, I'm, I, I've always been uh, um, wow. a really big <laughs> Probably like you, Doc, because uh, I, even though I wasn't alive when um, the Batman 66 show was actually airing mm-hmm. on television, um, I watched it through syndication. Oh, I was yeah. There all the time. Reruns, man. Right. And so I was a, always movie? a big fan. And of course, the movie. The mo- oh, the movie was the movie. great. Shark Repellent. Mm-hmm. Never forget Shark Repellent. Um, but, but what I found is that is game related that I, I thought would be interesting to just read a couple of snippets from it. Um, Adam West actually wrote a short um, op-ed in 1983. You're kidding. About video games and about where they were. And to, to put this in perspective for those that may not know their video game history, 1983 is two years before the NES came to America. Right. So this was pretty early. This was during, this was actually after the video game crash, but before it had recovered. Yeah. Is when he wrote this because the after video game e. crash had already, already occurred. Before Mario. Yes. Po- and, post ET, pre E3. Yes. Oh. Pre, well, wait, wait, pre E3. Um, so in that, uh, uh, he, pre. It's a me. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so West writes this actually very positive article about the future of gaming and where it might go. And some of what he says here is actually kind of prophetic. Um, one of the lines that he writes, um, he talks a little bit about the humor that, that is found in his Batman show. He's very, of course, very aware of it. And he says that I'd like to see a video game with, which features Batman as he was conceived in 1939, a shadowy creature of the night. Well, of course, we got that with the Arkham Asylum series, which went on to critical acclaim. Mm -hmm. Um, He also says towards the end here, and I kind of want to read out this part. He says, adventure characters should be just one facet of video gaming. In the same way a painting allows us to gaze upon the faces and souls of people from another age, or a book permits us to linger on the thoughts of great figures from history and fiction, video games can expand our awareness of the world as it is, was, or might be. The medium is still in its infancy, but read this again in a few years and see if this prediction hasn't come true. As video gaming grows, we will grow. Nice. And I think gaming has grown quite a bit since 1983. Yeah. Uh, We still have quite a ways to go, but um, I do do think it's uh, pretty neat that uh, someone that, an actor that I respected quite a bit, had such a positive view of the video game world, especially in a time where a lot of non-gamers tend to view gaming as a vice, one might say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, rest in peace, Adam. We loved you in Zombie Nightmare. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So I want to talk a little bit about a new board game that's come out. Uh, I use the, the, the term come out very loosely because it's in that gray space that sort of uh, just before the dawn moment where those who backed the Kickstarter have it and those who don't can pay $200 for it on eBay. Ah, gotcha. Uh, But it's called Outlive. And I had a chance to play this. Uh, One of uh, our our friends went ahead and picked it up. And I want to talk about it for a couple of reasons. And the 
first reason is it does not suffer from stretch goal fatigue. That's good. And and that's the idea that I've said in the past where you've got these games that have they do very well on Kickstarter and then it's like, um, oh, and you get this expansion and this will change the rules and then this will fundamentally alter everything. Um, but what they did was they did the the plastic upgrades, they did the sort of the the token upgrades, all that kind of stuff in some really intelligent ways. And and actually the sculpts are beautiful. Um, but the world itself that this game is set in is actually a post-apocalypse. It reminded me very much of like Fallout, except it's more of a resource management game. So if you can imagine playing something like uh, Agricola, but not really, uh, maybe something like uh, Pillars of the Earth or just any of the other, I mean, even like Scythe, um, but in a post-apocalyptic wasteland where if you don't feed the people who become a part of your, oh, I'll just call it a tribe, um, and, and living in your bunker, right? Uh, if you don't feed them, they're going to leave. And, and you also have to collect water. And you also have to make sure to uh, clean them off of radiation. And they go through a decontamination process before they populate a room. And, but there's lots of different upgrades and special abilities and that kind of a thing. This this almost reminds me of that one zombie survival game where you're in a big tribe. It's a board game. Okay. I'm drawing a blank on what it's called. Uh, Dead of Winter. Yeah, that one, I think. You know what? I actually can't stand Dead of Winter. Oh, really? Personally, yeah. Um, there's just a little too much you against the game mm. kind of a thing. It's the co-op. Um, you might win. You probably won't. This is actually a versus game, and I mm. really liked that aspect of it. Um, yeah, the board is a little bit out to get you, and you do have to sort of battle those forces. But more than anything, it's me versus the other people on the table. And I enjoy a good uh, versus game in that respect, especially one like Scythe, where you you build up your um, your resources and you kind of have special specialities and that kind of a thing. Um, it's very uneven start. So I would say it's balanced, but it's not... Um, it's not equal, it's equitable, if you know what I mean, because you mm. got kind of a random draw element. The thing is, one of the things they did beautifully in the game, um, if you can imagine just having like a, um, you know, you've got your board, but then you've also got the the board that your stuff is on, right? And then the tokens go onto that, that little personal tableau. Well, with the upgrade then, they got a thicker cardboard uh, overlay on the Tableau, glued it down onto the Tableau, and now everything insets and inserts into it. Hmm. So when you have your little plastic miniatures, they actually sort of plug in. Oh, nice. Um, and this is something Scythe did as well. I really love this, and I want to commend that sort of design as we move forward. But what I really like about the overall art direction and design, aside from it being beautiful sculpts and beautiful art, is that whenever they added all of that stuff, then like for the hero characters, what they did was they had a level, uh, it was like a level three, a level four, and a level five hero. That's their value. They just took the sculpts they already had and put them into a little base. And that base is sort of a collapsed ruin of a building with a big three behind it or a four or a five. And it plugs into that. So that you've got a Team. So your hero is basically a, a represented team using the exact same, you know, molds and sculpts as before. So there was very minimal work that they had to do for that stretch goal. It was very, very well thought out. It's a French team, French designers. Um, so there are a few little quirks in this first edition that I think will probably be fixed and solved by the time it hits mass market. Um, some of the translations are a little off. Uh, there's a few times in the rules where it says et instead of and. Ah. Where they lost. You know, they just didn't didn't pick up on it because it's a it's a sight word. Mm -hmm. And um, you know a, a few things like uh, when when you have um, objects and 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 well. Plurals that shouldn't be there. It, you can tell it's translation issues, in mm -hmm. other words. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make the game unplayable. I kind of think it makes it uh, a little quirky and fun. It gives <laughs> it a little bit of extra flavor uh, in that sense. But uh, check it out. If you can find it for a, a good price, um, honestly, it may even be worth checking it out on eBay and picking it up. Outlive. Uh, I predict it's going to be, when people figure it out, it's going to be the next popular game like Scythe hmm. um, that everybody is going to want a copy of. Is it something that you anticipate will be hitting retail at some point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know how it goes. Mm -hmm. It it takes a year or so for it to hit in enough of a, a production. But whenever they figure out that it's good, they change their like their manufacturer, and mm -hmm. then it takes a little while, and then it finally hits the stores. Gotcha. But uh, I know I'm going to be be picking it up eventually. Cool. Because it it just had that 
perfect sweet spot between resource management and post-apocalypse that I just love. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. So I've been playing, uh, I'm a little late to the party, but I've actually started playing Pocket Mortys Hmm. on my phone. Uh, Pocket Mortys is um, a game based on the popular Rick and Morty cartoon show from Adult Swim. And for those who are not aware of this show, I actually think it's it's quite brilliant. But um, it's essentially a in some ways a parody but it's mostly a black comedy um and it does have some some relationship to uh the back the future concept where you have this really intelligent but kind of um eccentric scientist who invents a lot of crazy inventions and he travels or and in this case he invents multi-dimensional portal guns travels across other dimensions etc um and he takes his grandson with him morty who is not really interested in all of the travel, but he gets kind of dragged along regardless. Oh, Doc and Marty, I get it. Right, Rick and Morty. So in Pocket Mortys, um, it's basically a parody of the Pokemon games, where instead of going around and, and collecting all the Pokemon, gotta catch them all, instead you're collecting different versions of Morty from other universes and you have to battle (laughs) other ricks and other universes and you have to get you actually get gym bags um gym bags gym badges Badges, from each of the ricks (laughs) when you defeat them the ones who are like the the leaders of that universe and so you have various types of mortys you have the thing Um, where like you're walking along and like uh someone challenges you with a morty when when, when two ricks eyes meet they have to battle yeah (laughs) exactly and and they they have a a simple system of uh similar to in Pokemon, and this is a lot of games have this concept, uh, Fire Emblem does it as well, mm-hmm. the kind of, we, we call it a rock, paper, scissors concept of, you know, there's usually three, dis- or like the weapon triangle in Fire mm-hmm. Emblem mm-hmm. in Pokemon, it's, it's what, grass, fire, and, and water? Well, there's a lot more I mean, now, there's more but, now, but yeah. that's the idea. Well, in Rick and Morty, it's just straight up rock, paper, scissors. Mm. They didn't bother to come <laughs> up with anything special. It's just rock, paper, scissors, and pocket Mortys. Nice. Um, so, but it's the same concept where, you know, if you, if you're fighting a scissor type, you want to use a rock type Morty and rock type attacks. <laughs> so it's, it's very, it's actually a very basic game, but I'm enjoying it because it's, it's uh, had some influence from one of the co-creators of the, of the series, uh, Justin Rowland. Um, he provides voice work for both Rick and Morty in the series. And he also does the voices in the game and he helped sort of come up with the story for the game as well, which does seem to fit in with the same sort of like theme and comedic style of the TV show. So um, it's an interesting game. Um, I would say if you haven't checked it out already and you're a fan of uh, Rick and Morty or Pokemon, it's probably worth a look. It is free to play. They do have the micro transactions, but I haven't really felt compelled to use any of them. As it is with mobile games? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And now... This week's meaty topic of discussion. Okay, so this uh, this topic sort of sprang out from a discussion that Doc and I had at one point where we were talking about, I think you were playing Horizon Zero Dawn at the time, um, and I was noticing how in the dialogue options, there's kind of like, they'll very explicitly tell you this is the brainy dialogue option this is the more emotional heartfelt dialogue option this is the sarcastic or whatever else um and so it kind of occurred to me that what's nice about that is you can go into it knowing that when i pick this option this is generally the sentiment that's going to come across but the concern that i have with that is that you might start to sort of second guess yourself as a player in the kind of like the role play sense of I want to be the kind hearted character. And so even if there's something that like kind of jumps out to me as being this option was probably what I would actually say in the situation, that's not the kind hearted option. So I'm going to go with the kind hearted option, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, And I think part of the reason they have that is to kind of remove some of that ambiguity that people sometimes complain about in dialogue options where you have the paraphrase and the paraphrase will say like you know very like one like short short phrase one to you know four words or something like that that kind of sums up what it is you're wanting to say um and i think that uh youtuber pro zd had a pretty good uh, parody of this at one point where uh he was making fun of just rpgs in general and he picked the dialogue option that said hello uh and then the dialogue that came out was hello effer yeah. i'm gonna murder your whole family <laughs> yeah. and it's like this is not what i wanted right. and so the the that sort of thing like you know players are sometimes surprised and this is sometimes just a bad design thing where you don't 
sufficiently communicate what it is they're going to be saying with that paraphrase. And sometimes that's just on the writer. Um, but so the, the, yeah. And like you said, there are a lot of different ways to, to handle this. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of, uh, one of the games that is known for dialogue choice and giving a lot of, um, option to the player is Planescape Torment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, they do give you that little, um, hint of context when it's, for example, if you're telling the truth or lying, it'll yes. tell you, it'll say, this is the truth, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll have this, the exact same sentence that you're going to say mm -hmm. but one says truth and one says lie right so that you can you can at least know you're choosing it on purpose to be a tr to be a lie or you choose it on purpose to tell the truth mm -hmm. um with planescape torment though they typically don't paraphrase mm -hmm. so yeah, you end up getting was, very long it's choices. literal that's what and, i and that's, I, I, that's I what up i like a couple yeah. here and that um, was that, i was actually going to say though that was that ties into another of the kind of choices you make in the way you present these mm -hmm. is you know on the one hand the long sentence gives you exactly what it is you're going to say and there's no ambiguity right on the other hand sometimes it takes you like you know several minutes to read through and think through all of these and mm -hmm. so if you're trying to go for a game that has a quicker pace which playing game torment isn't necessarily so maybe it works for that game it's definitely but, a slower pace game yeah and, and one of the things that that they do when you when you're playing through this game it feels very much like you're you're reading a novel with a, a, a great um soundtrack or really mm -hmm. more of like a soundscape um and then some visuals but it feels very much like a novel because there's a lot of reading um to use an example i found one of the screens here where um, you're speaking to a character named um, Seer the Skeptic. Mm. And Seer says, it looks like about about five sentences, so it's a full paragraph. Um, and then from there, you're given five dialogue choices. Mm -hmm. And each dialogue choice is at least one sentence, but uh, three of those choices are actually two or more sentences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in order to read what Seer the Skeptic, Skeptic says and then read over every single choice... It's going to take you a little bit of time. Now, mm -hmm. that said, there are conventions in the game that kind of get around this. Like, the last choice is typically the, I want to get out of here, mm -hmm. stop talking to me choice. Right. So you typically don't have to read that. It just kind of says, in this case, um, I must take my leave, farewell. Mm -hmm. So there you go. You know you're going to be kicked out. And then the other choice is the, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask you something else. And mm -hmm. that's the kind of like, take a step back in your dialogue tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's usually the choice right before the, I want to get out of here. So really, if you look at it, there's really only three dialogue options. And this is actually pretty common mm -hmm. for Planescape Torment. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really seem as overwhelming once you get used to it. There's a couple of exceptions um, for very key moments in the game where you have like 12 options. Mm -hmm. And that's because this is a really important point where you're, um, and they do this at the very end, the, in the climactic moment of the game. So, but for the most part, the options are not, not too bad. And if you think about it as a conversation, typically when you're speaking to someone um, and actually trying to have a back and forth, you're only going to be saying a few sentences before it's their turn to talk again. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not as overwhelming as you might think, but I can, I can see why games have gone with the paraphrase route. Right, right. A lot of them, because there are, it's basically a lot of reading, especially with nowadays games are going to speak that dialogue out loud. So it's yeah. almost like they're spoiling what's going to be said. Right. They don't want the said. repetitiveness. Yeah, and... it's repetitive, but I also think there's something kind of fun. One of the appeals to me in Bioware style games when I first started getting into, say, Mass Effect and um, Swotor was like kind of picking the sentiment I wanted to hear, but not knowing how I would say it in character. And then hearing how my character said in like this cool way that I wasn't necessarily anticipating, but still fit the, what I was going for. And I think another reason they, they chose that approach is because they wanted to have the cutscenes feel a little bit more cinematic. Right. Uh, Telltale does this as well, where you actually have a limited amount of time to choose a mm -hmm. dialogue. Option. And so they want to make it quick. Yeah. Yeah. So you can say, Oh mm -hmm. yes, no, you know, down is bad, left is good, etc. No, I, I just realized a, a game that I've played a little bit of uh, that I got recently kind of ties in well with this topic. Um, and I, I picked up a uh, pro wrestling game, mm -hmm. the latest uh, WWE 17, because I found it on sale mm -hmm. and thought, ah, I just pick it up and play a little bit because I, they have a promo system mm -hmm. where you actually get to, through dialogue choices, mm -hmm. Um, cut promos on other wrestlers. I honestly think that wrestling games are a little bit underrated. They're actually surprisingly yeah, fun. Yeah, they're surprisingly <laughs> fun for a while. I agree with you. They are pretty fun. Um, and I thought, it. I thought you know, just for the heck of it, I'd pick it up, see what the deal was. There's a ridiculous amount of characters. But I've been going through the story mode of the game where mm -hmm. you get to create your own wrestler. And um, part of, like, getting gaining popularity and and making the crowd associate with you, whether you're a good guy or a bad guy or face or a heel, is through the promos. Mm -hmm. So you're able to, um, uh, you're given, it's, it's five different choices. Well, each choice, I should say five blocks. 
but each block has about four different choices. Hmm. But the frustrating part, there's two, there's two things they do here, um, which makes sense for the genre, but it's, it goes to your point, it's a little mm-hmm. frustrating. One is that each crowd reacts differently based on the type of crowd they are. Mm-hmm. So they might be a hardcore wrestling crowd, or they might be kind of a family-friendly wrestling crowd, <laughs> or they might be like the good old boy, um, d- like down south, mm-hmm. you know, they just want to see like two big bruisers mm-hmm. beat on each other wrestling crowds. So I, can, these I different, can see that making sense though, because it, different cities, it like does. when you're touring, you have to sort of cater to that city. Exactly. So you have to kind of change your style. So there's not one direction to go. Mm-hmm. And you get, of course, bonus points if you, um, one, for doing things that, that incite the crowd, whether it's positive or negative, you want to go either all positive or all negative. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be a mixture. You want to try to be like all good guy or all bad guy. Right, right. Um, but the other thing, though, that, that, they, that they'll do is that you have to kind of make sure that each of your choices sort of tie into one another. So what you're saying overall makes sense. The problem here in this system, and I love the idea, the concept mm-hmm. is awesome. Mm-hmm. The problem is that they give you about four or five words of a paraphrase and then an ellipsis. And that's really all the hints that you get about what you're going to say. Mm-hmm. Sometimes not even that, sometimes even less. And so, but when you click on that choice, your character says, like a, like a full paragraph. Like mm-hmm. He just goes off for like, you know, 40 seconds. The, the, the classic wrestling rant. Right. Yeah. So that's a problem, though, because a lot of these choices I'm going through, I don't know what he's going to say. Mm-hmm. I read a part of it and I think, oh, he's going to compliment the crowd and say so-and-so, and I click it, and he ends up making fun of everybody, mm-hmm. and suddenly I'm being, tr- I'm being booed. Right. And that's, and that's one of those cases when, like, having the clear <laughs> intent would be helpful right. because right. you know you're trying to get a particular systematic result out of it, mm-hmm. um, and it's not giving you enough of a hint to kind of just, like, say what's actually, like, kind of on your heart so to speak mm-hmm. um so having a more systematic sort of representation would help there um but there's also again kind of that cost of like are you sort of i think in this case it would apply because you are putting on a show and you're going for a specific results but if it was more of a role-playing thing you're trying to actually be yourself so to speak mm-hmm. uh then you'd want it to be less obvious that's a just, really important thing i think you just said mm-hmm. If we're going into a game that gives you the agency to have a character that is the way that that you want your character to be, and I think you said Mass Effect Mm -hmm. was an example of this. Mm -hmm. It's a great example of this because my shepherd was probably very different than your shepherd. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not even just talking about little things like appearance and gender and that kind of a thing. But, I mean, this, you know, I I could go in with the idea that this guy's a space marine and he's going to be awesome and Mm -hmm. kick everybody's butt and not take any crap. And, you know, it's the John Wayne shepherd. Whereas someone else might come in with this idea of the the soft-spoken shepherd, the one who, um, who, who won't, ever do any kind of conflict except as a last resort. And you can do both of those games in Mass Effect, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Um, Versus, and you mentioned Horizon Zero Dawn. Really, no matter what choice you make with Horizon Zero Dawn, it's a subtlety. You're still playing Aloy, and Aloy is still going to be Aloy. And that character is who that character was created to be. Mm -hmm. She's got attitude. She's a redhead. She's fiery. uh, She's a warrior princess kind of thing, you know, all that. She's smarter than the rest of them, and she's going to pick up the tech, and she's going to integrate it whether you want her to or not. That's not a choice. So really all you're doing is is just sort of like a sliding scale on Mm -hmm. how sarcastic you want to be as Aloy. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's a completely different type of play, I think, than what you're doing in Mass Effect. Now, tying all of that back in then to... The other example you gave, Jim, which was um, Torment, there's something really important about the the difference or the, call it the, the design choice that was made with Mass Effect, which I, I think I would point to as being the first one that really did the textual or the contextual type of hints well. I, I would I would argue that Bioware actually did that sooner with uh, the Swotor. Oh game. yeah, with Co- with well, Kotor nice actually. Kotor game. Kotor, yeah. Kotor, Kotor though Kotor had like, came yeah yeah not not Swotor right. Yeah. Yeah. Kotor, Kotor though no, you're also right, you're had right. Kotor the, did that like the full sentence though. Yeah, that's what um, he said. because there wasn't yeah. even voiced uh, dialogue. It was that you. That's the main point. Mm-hmm. I think that's the the key mm-hmm. point here is that where the switch started, and you can point to different games that did it well or not well, and then the transition. But the truth is, the games now are fully voiced, and if they're not fully voiced, even we can talk, we can point to Swotor actually as being a the full the first fully voiced MMO was right. the big tagline, right? Right, right. The fully voiced thing is a problem. If you read the dialogue and you're like click. This is perfect. This is what I want to say. And then your character says it, you're going to click through the dialogue. You're not even going to listen to it. Right. You're going to skip past it because there's nothing interesting there. So there's this important moment of um, 
being as being removed from your agency as a character to listen to what the character says within the context of that. And that can both work really beautifully so that you become a little bit of the audience in that moment and it can backfire horribly. I think the important design decision that we need to focus on for uh, Torment, for Planescape, is they wanted you to take Nameless, because that was the character's name, Nameless, and mold him and sculpt him and bring him into the character you wanted him to be for this run through this so life. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I think that they're not, and I, I agree with you for the most part, but mm-hmm. I think there's, a, there actually is some character there that they're giving you too of, of nameless. Of well, the there's, nameless there's one. history, but that's different. No, but I mean the way that he presents himself in conversation, I think is important to point out. So like you mentioned how everything Eloy says is kind of a, a sarcastic, like different levels of sarcasm. Yeah, there's a character so, there. Right. And with nameless, it's the same way. I would say that's a persona and that's slightly different. Mm, but every single like the way like the way that he speaks he has this formal tone regardless of how he's like if he's saying something evil or if he's lying or if he's saying something righteous he has this formal tone of the way that he speaks like for example the one i just read off that one example with when with him leaving he says i must take my leave farewell okay you don't have an option of screw you guys i'm going home but that's partly <laughs> in the reading of it now you're you're not arguing that 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 it was no, voice no, no. acted. No, I'm you're not. saying that the way that it was written is there's it, a he has a certain. My point is he has a certain voice. I'll give you that. You're, yeah, you're able to you're able to choose. Am I a good person? Am I a violent person? Am I a thief? Am I like you have all these choices in terms mm-hmm. of your personality for sure. Mm-hmm. But there's still some character there too. Nameless. If you think of all the voice, because the game does have voice by uh, dialogue, voice yeah. dialogue. Well, it's just, yeah, but not for nameless. It, yes, it does. Really? Yes, it does. Are you, did you play the, the remastered version? I play the original version. And it, I'm not saying that he doesn't read off his lines like this. Uh-huh. It's that every character has a few lines that they'll say like when they're in battle or like sometimes they'll go meet someone new and he'll say like, he'll say like oh, an introductory okay. line. It's like, it's flavor lines. So you yes. know what his voice should sound like. You're right. And so every it's kind of like is, Zelda then. It's you're you're absolutely of, yes. right. And every time that he says those things, he always speaks with that very formal tone. That's which true. Which is contrasted when you meet his other characters, the history of his other when you when you see them and the way they talk, some of them are like brutish and they just kind of grunt and they they barely can form a, hey, form a book, sentence together. What you doing? Yeah. Right. You're but right. But our version of Nameless is clearly a very um, he's very well spoken. He's very um, formal. He's even, a bit of a gentleman. He's a bit of a gentleman, even when he's being a jerk to someone. That's a, so you make it, a really good case, Jim. Yeah, you make a really good case. Uh, and I think that kind of leads us into another sort of point that I think ties into this. Um, and I, I kind of had this thought. I was reminded somewhat of, uh, I was actually thinking back to our very first episode where we had the, uh, will you kick the puppy or kick the kitten? We were talking about there not actually being any real choices and r- real consequences in games. It's asking you which version of bad do you want to be? And I think that, I want to be ultra bad. <laughs> kick the kitten. It's like, and then other people are like, no, the dog is the worst one. But the, the point being is that two legs, that, that, that sort of, a, <laughs> that sort of example is um, like, it's an extreme example. It's kind of a funny example. And that was kind of the point when we had it, mm-hmm. but it also does kind of happen in games. And I think that this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but we can talk about it more where basically I compare it to when you are trying to deal with a toddler who doesn't want to do the thing you want them to do. So rather than asking, are you going to eat your food or not? You say, do you want food A or food B? And so you give them some choice, but both of the choices do you want, if that makes sense. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Video games think we're children. Well, actually, that's that's kind of where I'm going with <laughs> well, this. It, is, it, it's the rail, that's the railroading yes, that, we, that, yeah, that Doc mentioned yeah. before, where if a game wants you to do something, but they want you to feel like you have agency. They'll give you a choice, but mm-hmm. your choices are going to still lead you to generally the same mm-hmm. direction. And I think that this isn't necessarily a bad thing because, you know, we take the example of Shepard, um, where I think that this is like, it's not quite Planescape, but it's also not quite Aloy, where you can kind of, I think that we've said this before, the way Bioware sort of approached it is um, Paragon is doing the right thing the right way, uh, Renegade is doing the right thing by any means possible. Either way, Shepard is going to be doing the right thing, in theory. Um, or ultimately, he's going to be doing the right thing. He's got a particular mission he's trying to accomplish. And so I think that, you know, even if you apply this to real life, 
when you are faced with a decision, oftentimes there are protocols in place where, uh, you know, if you're doing your job correctly, and we can usually assume that players are going to want to do their job, um, they'll be presented with a choice. And given the circumstances, you should sort of like go through a flow chart, a decision flow chart that says, given A, B, and C, I should do either A or B, and A is preferable if D is also present, if that makes sense. Um, but so like we kind of get to this place where you're in the field and you know, this is generally what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, what choice do I make? I think that's a valid thing. You're not just going to say like, if you are a, you know, a firefighter and you have the choice of like, do I do a or B? You're not just going to say, "Hmm, no, I'm just going to go and leave the site and not deal with the fire. Uh, you know, so it it depends on the game that you're, that you're making because when you're doing, anytime you're doing an open world game and you're trying to give players all this choice and the way that they can approach problems. You get into a situation where the player wants to have that option of, do I want to run into the burning building and save this, the puppy? Mm-hmm. Or I see a kitten on the side of the road, I'm just going to throw it in the burning building. <laughs> you know, you, you, if you're just an open world game, you want to give them those sort of an op- option. Whereas if the game itself is fire, fireman simulator, mm-hmm. and your whole point of this game is to be a, the best fireman you can be, well, you might have, your options could be, I'm going to, you know, break the door down with my axe and go in through the front door or I'm going to take the ladder and go in through the window Mm -hmm. or I'm going to just stay outside but I'm going to use the fire hose to try to put the fire out with 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 a water blast Mm -hmm. so there's a kitten in one room and a puppy in the other one (laughs) which (laughs) one will you say you can only say one (laughs) and you're Batman and the Joker did it yeah Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) that's a perfect segue Jim to Firewatch Mm -hmm. which is about you being one of those wilderness firefighters uh, or rather you're, you're up in the tower. You're not actually one of the firefighters, but, but you watch for forest fires. And over the course of the game, a fire, you know, a fire does come, a forest fire, as one might expect. You can do nothing about it. And the powerlessness that you experience as a part of that is really, I think, integral to the game experience. If you think about what happens in that game too much, you realize that that game is completely on a rail. There is just literally nothing that you can do that really changes any of the mechanics of the game or how the story ends or what what's true about the mystery. The beauty of that game comes in, you make narrative decisions that are meaningful to you in your mind, mm-hmm. period. That's it. How are you going to respond to this? It doesn't matter how you respond. You can be a complete and total jerk or you can be nice guy all the way through. You can learn, you can, you can create a you know, sort of mold a, a character arc if you want through the dialogue by the end of it. So that by the end, you've had this profound experience of the storytelling of the changing of this character, or you can not. And I, and I think that that, that comes down to very well crafted, well written dialogue is going to allow you to believe that the choices you're making are meaningful. As long as you're not mm, pretending or, or lying to the player to, to say, oh, I trust, this is really a meaningful decision. No, it's not. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I think it's fine. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, I think there, there comes, d- make the game that you're making, in other words. In, in, in Zero Dawn, for example, there is one dialogue choice, one, that may or may not uh, actually change whether or not you can play a mission. Mm. And I can't confirm or deny this. I haven't actually looked it up. I could probably look it up and find out. But um, the, basically, it's it's get out of my face or um, anybody would have done that. And if you do the anybody would have done that, then it's like, well, will you help me go rescue my family? And it might simply be that if you say, get out of my face, he goes, no, please have mercy on me. Mm. I need you to help me with my I family. I think I know that. Yeah. That dialogue option. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, uh, it's been a while since I played. Uh-huh. But I think I did the get out of my face because I was doing. And you like still the, had to do the mission to help I, him save his family, I right? Think so yeah, yeah. So it's a false choice. Yeah, and and that's what I'm, and and that fits with everything else in the game, right? Where where basically the dialogue is there for one reason alone, and that's to um, be a little bit of icing on your cake. But the cake is the same no matter what. I, in that sense, it's not a role playing game. It doesn't mm-hmm. change the story. So I'm okay with it. As long as I know that that's what it is I'm doing. Does that well, make sense? And, and Horizon Zero Dawn never really struck me as a role-playing game no, to begin with. No, it's got RPG elements, but even yeah. those are broken. Yeah, it's basically... <laughs> deeply, deeply It's broken. essentially yes. an action game from what yeah. from what I can tell. Yeah. And so Open I wanted to bring action. up... Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to bring up another game that I played somewhat recently for the PS4, um, Until Dawn. Mm. Uh, that's, a, that's a horror adventure game. Yeah, we talked about that back at Halloween. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. and there's, a, there's actually a lot of choice in that game in terms of the way that you can handle things. You basically control a group of teenagers that are in a cabin, and suddenly murders start to happen, and you have to figure out what's going on, and you have to survive, and some of the choices that you make can get some of the kids killed. Yeah. Or 
not killed if you make the right choices. Wow. But there's still an overall narrative. There's still one person is, there's, you know, one, I say one person, not exactly, but essentially there's one person that's behind what's going on mm -hmm. and that doesn't change based on your choices. So it's, it's not like those choose your own adventure books where the, the old lady might be a, um, a crazy old hag who's going to try to try to make, bake you into cookies. Or she's a nice grandmother that wants to give you cookies. Depending on your depending choice. Depending on your choices. And that doesn't happen. Cookies this, are going to happen one way or the right. other. Yeah. yeah. Well, but this, my, <laughs> my point is that this, in Until Dawn, the same story is playing out. But you actually get a lot of choice in terms of the flavor of that story and how it advances and who survives that night mm -hmm. in the cabin. So um, it's, it's very different from something like the, the Horizon Until Dawn. But in this case, it isn't like the entire game play itself, all of the mechanics is the choice. And some of the choices are action-y sequences, but it's basic things like, do I want to go the, the, the quick route by trying to run up this cliff to try, to try to catch up to, you know, this girl who's about to get murdered? Or do I want to take the safe path? And if I take the hard path, I might slip on a rock and you have to do like a quick time event to, to see if you get up in time. And is and, there a quick time event that actually has an impact on the gameplay? Yes. Okay. If you fail, if you fail. It doesn't fail, just restart. It doesn't restart. You, you're now at the bottom again, and now you have to take the long way. But now, now it's you've wasted your time, so now right. you for sure don't catch up. Mm -hmm. Versus the, um, taking the safe way, you're perfectly fine. There's no chance of you getting hurt or, or broken up, but you're slower, mm -hmm. and so you're going to get there afterward. Right. It reminds me a little bit of um, Heavy Rain, too. It's similar. The, yeah. the thing I liked about Until Dawn, and I think I'm glad you brought up Heavy Rain and, and other David Cage. He also did, um, in the, what was it called? Um, Beyond Two Souls. I think that's yeah. right, yeah. I mean, he's doing Detroit Become Human is the new one that we might see at E3. Hmm. Trying to tie, tie it back into E3. But um, he, his games are known for those very much fake choice. Mm -hmm. And Until Dawn plays like a David Cage game actually done well. Hmm. Because you actually have choice. You actually have agency in what's going on. But it's still telling a, a narrative. It's still telling an interesting story. And there's still a destination. There's still a beginning, middle, and end. It's still interesting, but you feel like you have some control over what's happening. And so I guess kind of the, the question that I would have this lead up to is, you know, is there kind of a, an ideal way to present dialogue options? And I think, you know, we've kind of said, and this is a little bit of a cop-out answer, but it's also the real answer, <laughs> that it kind of depends on the game that you're making and what it is you're trying to accomplish with the dialogue. I, I, think, I think we can more easily identify the wrong way to do something than to say there's just one right way. Right, yeah. Because it... It's Cer dependent on the game. It's mm -hmm. certainly dependent on the game. Yeah. But if you're making something like, um, well, the examples that we just did with, with say, Heavy Rain, mm -hmm. I feel like um, it was kind of a failure in what it was trying to do in terms of those dialogue choices. But if you're, you're going to compare something like, say, um, the, the original Mass Effect to uh, Planescape Torment, well, these are presenting your choices in a very different, in a different way. They're both role-playing games, but I think that, that their systems work for what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I'd really like to see some more of the old Planescape style, though, in one regard specifically, maybe not having the full text out, but but the, the, the lie truth part, because just having that added into it, you've brought in a two by two. Let's say it's a binary question. Yes, no. Are you going to help me? That could mean anything. My answer, yes, truth. Yes, lie. No, truth. No, lie brings us to all four of the possibilities in the two by two. Mm -hmm. And that kind of a design, just, just in that framework of thinking, whenever you say to your writer, okay, this is the way we're going to make this game. Every choice is going to have at least a two by two option within it for that. Um, some of it might be in the course of gameplay. Some of it might just be in the dialogue itself, but I'd love to see some more of that. And I, I can't think of a game that has done that well since Planescape. Um, a more recent game that actually does dialogue choices pretty well. Uh, I don't know. I haven't played enough of it to know whether or not it does that mm -hmm. sort of thing with the like lying and all that. Um, I, I imagine it would. Uh, Pillars of Eternity, which is a uh, sort of a spiritual successor to the old Baldur's Gate game. Oh, yeah. right. And I, I was actually going to say the same thing. Uh, yeah. um, there was that one and also the Torment Tides of Num Numenera uh, came out recently, which is the spiritual successor to Planescape Torment. Correct. Well, there you go. So both of those have come out recently. I, I will say that, um, how far did you get in, in Pillars of Eternity? Not very far. I played for about five hours, but I was really impressed with the dialogue. Right. Um, that was my experience, too, is I played for probably about the same length of time, maybe a little longer, 
Um, One thing that I really enjoyed about it was the fact that a lot of the dialogue options were tied to your stats. Like I had a character mm-hmm. who had a very high lore stat, so I was able to um, have dialogue options that were tied to my knowledge of the game world. And otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to like they. I wouldn't have even seen them. So I would, I would love if there was like a, a commentary on modern misinformation where if your lore stat is low, but you can still give a lore answer that's actually incorrect or something like that. Anyway. That would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but so, but my question though, because since we are talking about these dialogue choices, would be, um, why do you think you quit? Um, uh, I just wasn't in the mood for that kind of RPG at the time, and I never got around to it. <laughs> that was that was my experience with it too. So I think there's something there's something to be said for that as well. Mm-hmm. Um. Is it is it possible? Is it just that the writing wasn't as strong as some of these earlier games, or is it because we don't have as much time to play them to sit down and, and digest them, or is is it something that that we just feel like it's antiquated? I mean, well, what's the real it, reason here? If it tells you, if it tells you anything, I, uh, I I stopped playing and then immediately started playing Metroid Fusion. So I think I was just <laughs> oh, in the well, mood for go. something else. <laughs> and, and I'm I'm not trying to come down on you right. because I had the same experience. Yeah. So I think I think oh you played Metroid Fusion too. Well, of course, I, of course, I have, yeah. but not that wasn't what I yeah. what I yeah. quit Pills of Eternity yeah. for. But I just mean I had the same experience of mm-hmm. enjoying it, the game it, for a while, but then risks, feeling like I don't I want to do something else now. It risks yeah. not gripping you. There is something to be said for a game, even if you weren't necessarily like wholly in the mood for it. If a game is able to grip you sufficiently, then you'll sort of That's become right. in the mood for well, it. Well, I'm exactly a, I'm a right. really big fan of Baldur's Gate, so I'm probably going to get back into Pillars of Eternity at some point. Yeah, but. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't really know why I didn't mm. keep playing it. Yeah. <laughs> for, for me, one of the things that I think has, has let me come back to Planescape Torment, mm-hmm. and I have replayed that game many times, um, is the audio. I mean, mm. the, the fact that you are the, the, the soundscape, the music under, undertones, um, it just creates such a, you know, vibrant world. You feel like you're there. You feel like you're in um, Sigil. You feel like you're in Sigil. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that's an important experience if you're going to be playing a game where you're basically just reading constantly. Mm-hmm. And so maybe w- with Pillars of Eternity, um, I didn't think the music was bad, but it, it didn't really draw me in in the same way. That's and, a good point, And yeah. the cities didn't feel as alive and as vibrant as Sigil did. I, I really did like the graphics and the art style in Pillars of Eternity, but uh, it didn't scratched quite the same itch that Baldur's Gate did Mm. for me anyway. I think for me, if I'm going to approach kind of an ideal dialogue system, and this is assuming that we're going more for like, I'm actually role-playing and I'm making decisions that will impact how things turn out, um, is to have the paraphrase, because I do like having voice acting or having um, situations where my, um, I I know what it is that I want to say, but I want my character to say better than I could. Mm -hmm. Um, It's one of the uh, kind of appeals of voiced video games in that way. Um, having, uh, the, the paraphrase, but done well to make sure there's never any sort of like, it, to whatever extent you can avoid me saying something that I didn't mean to say. And that can be tricky to do, but if we can sort of master that, that's good. Um, and then also keeping it, uh, I've, I've complained before on here about how mass effect, once you figure out that top is paragon, bottom is renegade, that it kind of ruins it for me, making it so that the order is random. Um, or at the very least, the order is such that like, it's, it's never systematic in that way, aside from something like, say, in um, Torment, where the, you know, the bottom is always kind of the back out option. I don't necessarily mind that as far as like, you know, menu navigation in a sense. Well, um, aren't those two just, things in conflict with each other, though? I no, mean, I, I, don't, I don't think so, because what you're doing is returning to or going from a hub or you're entering a side conversation. I'm cool with that. What I don't want is to know that the top option is always good. Uh, well, that's what I mean. Um, well, you're, you're saying you want more clarity in what it is that your intent is, but if you've got them in that order, that's exactly what I guess what you're I, doing. I guess what I mean to say is not that I know that this is the good guy thing to say. It is that I know that what I'm what I'm selecting, which is what my instinct is, is going to be what comes out of my character's mouth. If that makes sense, I d- I don't want okay. the hello effort thing. Yeah, <laughs> but at the same time, what you've got is, um, well. You've, you've still got a subjective interpretation mm-hmm. of what that might or might not be on, in terms of the player. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you're talking about an extreme where your Paragon character has suddenly flipped off the room. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe in a different way, it, if he says something that well, – you ever, you ever watch a movie and, or, or a TV show and you just know that the actor said that line in a way that was different than the way the writer wrote it? Mm. You ever you ever have those just little disconnect moments where you're like, no, that that was intended to have emphasis on the second word, not mm-hmm. the third one. Right, right. 
it's kind of like that. That that can happen in video games too, where mechanically the effects of that are just sort of programmed in as a value, but the the voice acting or or some other aspect of it may not make sense. Where you why are you even having a conversation? He's got a gun in your face. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. Grab his gun and and, and mm-hmm. kick him in the nards. And, I mean, and that, that's kind of why I don't like. I, I don't see really much benefit in the Paragon and Renegade system in general as, oh, a, as I agree. a game mechanic. I yeah, agree. because what if you've got a situation where you're trying to I don't know somebody's like you're at a bank robbery and there's a guy with hostages and you shoot the bank robber and that's seen as as renegade because you killed somebody but you were saving hostages that's a good thing right so you the player might think oh that's that was a totally paragon thing why did it give me renegade points and mm-hmm. affect my score well and i'm kind of hoping it, to bring this back around to, to what we talked about earlier that that maybe in um a way out you know the the prison escape game we talked about earlier mm-hmm. that that those will be more natural because you remember you said you're going to get to know the characters. Right. And that, that's in the gameplay trailer is you're going to get to know the characters. That implies that there's a difference between the characters. Mm-hmm. That makes me right. think actually of GTA. Uh, was it five? five GTA that had five the, yeah. where they had the three. Yes. And I, and I, but see, my impression from a way out is that there aren't going to be any dialogue choices, that it's going to be completely in the cutscenes, and your choices are how you approach the problem similar to GTA. That's like the in, sense that I'm getting. Yeah. yeah. Like that in is, GTA, there's no true. dialogue choices. But your character still has voices, and then you choose how you react in the situation. But because you see, for example, Tre- Trevor is this crazy, violent redneck, when you're playing as Trevor, you tend to play as a crazy, violent redneck. Yeah, there's really no opportunity for you to change the characters. Right. Yeah. And so maybe the thing that we need to be looking at then is not so much do I get good or bad points based on whether I said the renegade or the paragon thing, but everything ultimately leads to a character is going to react to your character a particular way based on what you said. And, you know, again, kind of uh, not to sidetrack too much, but going back to the Aloy option, I would love to have the brainy and the heartfelt and the sarcastic responses, mm-hmm. but don't show me which ones they are. Just let me say what it is that I'm thinking. And then the system knows that it was but, that sort of response. But don't tell us after you make but, the but then, but Again, I don't, want, I don't want to double, I don't want to second guess myself and like change it to, I'm going to do this one because that one had the heart on it. Right. But you still need to know, I think like, like Doc is saying, you have to know what those choices are when you're reading it. And it's not like a game where um, some of the older games, like a Planescape Tournament, where you can read that line, mm-hmm. you read the full sentence, you know what it says. Oh, sure. So yeah. you can go, oh, okay, mm-hmm. I have an idea about what this might mean. Yeah. Whereas if you're just giving them a paraphrase, especially if it's short, mm-hmm. you may not know what's going to come out of and their that, mouth. And that's the risk you run, yeah. So, so uh, I think, that could be very frustrating so, for a gamer. But do, doing the paraphrase well enough that it doesn't become an issue, which is, again, you know, kind of like, this is assuming I mean, there's always but I don't think you can, I, yeah I don't think you can do that I think mm-hmm. you have to say you, I'm not necessarily saying you should say Paragon or Renegade because that's just silly mm-hmm. but you could say um, snarky sarcastic um, you know uplifting you can just des- you can describe the the way that that's yeah. what's being said and, so and it, it gives again, you an idea that, that's running into the same issue I'm having where like if I don't want my character to ever be sarcastic then I'm steering away from the thing I might actually say because even if I don't want to be sarcastic, but, I might be sometimes. But hold on. That's, 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 that's not the true. same thing, though, because if it, if it reads, if you write the whole line out saying something sarcastic and you read it, oh, that's clearly sarcastic, what he's saying. I'm just not going to choose that because I don't want my character to be sarcastic. Exactly. It's, exa- it's, it's that the same point. Thing as Whereas if you don't say it, yeah, so, if you don't uh, say sarcastic, maybe, how are you going to know it's Maybe sarcastic? tone and the type of character you are need to be separated then. So exactly. I, I am, no, that's what I'm saying. I am yeah. a brainy exactly character, but like I can still know maybe that it's a sarcastic tone. But I'm steering away from that for a second. I think what we need is for the way that the system reacts to, that the world reacts to, needs to be based on, in a way, if you're sort of simulating how another character reacts to you. So even if I'm saying something that I would actually say that I think is going to come across well to them, they don't take well to it. And then they tell their friends that I'm a terrible person and that's the, how the game reacts or that, that I make that a decision of the, the telltale uh, so-and-so will remember that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Except if that actually did anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, or, you know, again, another sort of telltale example, I made this choice that ended up meaning that the town burned down when it might've been saved. This is just a random example, but then people react to the fact that the town burned down. It doesn't matter how I was talking to people. Mm-hmm. It's just the fact that town burned down. That's what they're reacting right. to. Yeah. Now, now you're making me think of Skyrim where you walk into a town and they discuss some random aspect of your character. And by the time you are at the end of the game, you're the king of everything. Mm-hmm. You, <laughs> you run all the guilds and <laughs> you're like some demigod. Hey, I and know then who you are. Hail Sithis. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's like, I don't know. It just, 
it has always seemed to bother me just a little bit that if you have a choice to pick up a gun or not pick up a gun or to put down your gun or not put down your gun and then talk to somebody, there are some games that, you know, just through the ages have, have said, hey, whoa, put that gun down and we'll talk. Mm-hmm. And I love those little moments yeah, yeah. where it's like, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, and you put your gun down and then it's like, okay, what do you want? Because it's immersive. It, it reminds it's you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I'm okay with a, with a game saying, listen, this is the character and you're playing them. That's agency, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and I'm okay with a game saying, plunge yourself into this character. This is either, um, you know, a hollow character or I wouldn't say, I wouldn't be able to say a mute character because obviously they're going to have dialogue or they won't. But, you know, somebody that you can fill with the character you want them to be like a fallout. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think you have to know what kind of game you're making or else it doesn't work. Um Horizon Zero Dawn with the with the little icons and the choices. I think that was a great decision. I think it was entirely appropriate. But I think, um, like like Nick said, this you know that wasn't a role playing game. Right. It was never intended to be. Um, but at the same time, something like mm, let's go with Mass Effect. I think that what it did at the time was revolutionary. And I think a lot of people, may, maybe you too, Chris, um, whenever they realized that that the sequence never changed, were surprised, frustrated, and it felt like they'd cracked a code. I don't know that that was ever intended to be this great mystery. Yeah, I don't think it was either. It, I, it, it seemed like it was being pre- – when I played obvious. it, mm-hmm. it felt like it was pretty obvious what those choices were and that they were they, – they just left them in the same spot to make it easier for you to select the one that you yeah, wanted to be. it's a tool for role play. I right. think the most common thing that I ran into with Mass Effect was – Choosing between the actual Paragon option and the more neutral option or something like that, where like, you know, I tended to be Paragon, but I wasn't gunning for 100% Paragon. So I wasn't just automatically clicking Paragon, Paragon, Paragon. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be the gray Jedi. No, it wasn't even that. It was that I I wanted to be how I would react. And there are some times when my reaction is not. I'm going to be full Paragon, but it's also not I'm going to be Renegade. I, I, I want to be neutral, I, I, but you neutral. Want, you want a neutral, neutral reaction, but you want to get the Paragon points, so uh, you yeah, compromise yeah. your character to get the points. Yeah, there you go. The second time it, through when I'm trying to get 100% Paragon, the yeah. role play is gone. Don't, don't you think I, – I think that that's more uh, – speaks to another problem yeah, in Mass a Effect. argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, where really – you're wanting to play, okay, I'm going to be myself in the situation, but you're not yourself. Mm-hmm. You are yeah, you only com- have three options. But, and also, but also you're Commander Shepard. Sure, yeah. yeah. You are Commander Shepard. Well, okay, maybe games. when I say be myself, be my vision of Shepard, which is not necessarily... But that yeah. hasn't been what you've said all this time, and I think that's because you really are trying to play it as though you're yourself in the situation. But I think that's, that's not the way that you should approach those, those per- games. Perhaps. I mean, well, the, the, the me, it is kind of a gray area, though, The me because... that is the commander of a spaceship, which but, I am not. But that you would be quite, a, quite different, is my point. And so mm-hmm. I don't know if... I think that instead of role-playing as Shepard which is what the game wants you to do. That's why they give you the Paragon Renegade choices. They want you to role play as Shepard. Instead, you're saying, well, I want to play it as me and as Shepard. But that's never what Mass Effect is set, setting you up for. And I say I, I this... Think, I think maybe the game didn't make that clear enough, if that's maybe, the issue. Maybe not. Maybe because not. Because that could be. Maybe, maybe they wanted it to be like, you are Commander Shepard. This is just different shades of Commander right. Shepard. Yeah. That, that was my impression playing the game, personally. But, but I only played the first one. Because, like, for example, you yeah, can change your first name. They just call you Shepard because they wanted to have a name they could call you. Right. Yeah. But, and you can change your but appearance. But is that, is that the reason, or is it because you are, you are Commander Shepard? See, I think it's because you are Commander Shepard. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think it's just I'm not clear you. enough. I'm with you on this one, Jim. And I think, mm-hmm. honestly, if we really wanted to get into it, we could say that that might be the reason why people didn't like the original ending of 3 either. Yeah. Is because they weren't willing to accept the narrative that was being handed to them and the story that was being told for them. And it may just all come down to bad marketing, that, that the game that was sold was not the game that was made, if that makes sense. Was it that the people didn't want to accept the ending, or was it because Mass Effect... Uh, led people to believe that they had more agency than they did. Well, what is when when you say Mass Effect led? Do you mean the marketing team of Mass Effect led us to believe that, or, or that the, the game, game itself? I would led say us to both. If Chris, if Chris is thinking, you know, that Shepard is him, and Jim is thinking that Shepard is Shepard, 
Um, Your name is literally Shepard. I think I have a pretty good argument here. <laughs> but but again, they <laughs> but, let you. But, but they it's, let you it's, it's unclear though, because just because they have the same name doesn't necessarily it's, mean but it's, it's not, the same person every time. I didn't say it's the same person every time. I'm saying that, but like like Doc is saying, it's shades of the same character, yeah. and and right. that's also born through with your dialogue choices. You only have a few of them, and you pretty much have to do the same. You're going on the same mission every time. The only difference is how you approach it. Well, like, let's like Doc let's take player. let's take Knights of the Old Republic for example. Spoilers for a 12 year old game. But uh, it turns out there's a big plot twist. You're actually Revan, right. the Sith. Right. What? But, oh, yeah. but you're also um, uh, amnesiac throughout right. the entire yeah. you know, first three quarters of the game. That, does that mean that you're a different character or you're just different shades of amnesiac Revan the whole time? Different shades of amnesiac Revan. Yeah, yeah I would agree with what's, Jim on that What's one. your reasoning with that? Same reason is that the number of choices that you're given and the way they're presented and the way that you're going on your quest... You're all you're all sort of being funneled to one direction, yeah. pretty much. But that's the classic amnesiac story as well. Right. Is that if you lose all your memories, are you still at at your core the same moral individual, or can you be a different moral individual? It, it without is a little your bit memories? different because there is the amnesiac element too. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that's the story. That's the the classic amnesiac story. Is I'm a better person because I'm not who I was. That's Inter- Planescape Prey. Torment. I yeah. mean, Planescape Torment. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's a big. That's, that's, that's the whole thrust of the game. It's like you're trying to figure out who you are, and the choices you make in that game, that's determining who you are. And that is the surprise reveal, true topic for today. Wow! See what I did there? Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that you know what I'm saying and what you guys are saying are mutually exclusive too, because I think that maybe there's just a little bit of a miscommunication. I realize that I'm not me. I realize that I am Shepard, and that mm-hmm. Shepard is going to be along these lines. I guess what I'm saying is I want to be able to say that my Shepard is the one that is 75% Paragon, if that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to explain it in terms that are hopefully trying to communicate the idea. I think and, I get you. But I, I would agree that we are agreeing on one big topic, and uh-huh. it's that ultimately whenever a writer writes dialogue for these types of games, if you're writing it in a tree, which mm-hmm. is really the kind of game we've been talking about here, yeah. um, really what you're writing is um, a limited set. Yeah. And so you have the you have you have two problems whenever you write this way. The first problem is what's called the infinite shelf problem. If mm-hmm. you give too many choices, then the player is going to have an infinite shelf, and there's not they're going to have total vapor lock. They're not going to be able to make a choice at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. And I almost felt, Jim, like um, Planescape Torment had an infinite shelf problem for me. Um, I noticed that um, almost uh, Pillars of Eternity almost had an infinite yeah. shelf problem as well. Yeah, um, but then the the sort of equal and opposite problem of that. Um, is whenever you um, you've limited them so much that you don't have proper agency mm-hmm. within, and I think that may be what you're talking about, Chris. Is that idea that that whenever you came to it, you didn't like any of the three choices, or rather that I did, but then the system was trying to steer me away from one. Right. Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I can I can completely get that. I mean, I mean the 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 Telltale games, several of them have that problem where. You literally don't like any choice that you're presented with. Mm-hmm. I agree. That happens a lot in 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 the worst because they sort of have they have some good games and some bad games. Mm-hmm. So the ones that are they're bad are bad not so much because your choices don't matter because your choices don't matter in any of them. Mm-hmm. But you know what? Not I think really. I think there's a bleed through effect on that. Yeah. Because The Walking Dead was the first one, and because The Walking Dead was the first one, the whole point of Walking Dead, the comic, all the way through to the series, all the way through to the game, and all the properties that have you know the transmedia properties that have to do with Walking Dead is there's no right choice here. What are you going to do? Wow, how convenient for them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I think that's why it was a brilliant choice for that. The problem is that whenever you get over into other properties then, whether that be Wolf Among Us or... Uh, Batman. You know, Batman, <laughs> yeah. Th- then, then if you've got sort of the same writers in the same mode and the same thinking, doing the same thing with the, with, with, with the same tools, when they could have done a different thing with the same tools, it fails. Because it's a different world. And I, I think that also um, Walking Dead, because of the world that you're in, having those extreme options makes sense. Yeah. Because you're in an apocalyptic yeah, situation, absolutely. So you have to have an extreme option. But for a lot, for a, other games, the other situations, those extreme options don't make a lot of sense. Yeah. And that's why, if you're playing some of these other games, um, Mass Effect could be one of them. But really, I'm thinking something like um, Kotor. You know, some of those, some mm-hmm. of those options on the extreme ends of good or bad are just kind of silly. I mean, yeah. you still you accept it because Star Wars the one is where, fantasy. Yeah, but. there was the one where there was an alien getting be- like uh, beat up by some human, and it's like, 
do you join in and kill the yes. alien yes. or do you help him and save the day? Mm-hmm. And, and those choices but on the were, other hand, there was also grayer in the middle choices. No, there were. Like I, I, just I, walk away from the situation right. or tell off the guy who was mm-hmm. beating him. I, I thought KOTOR did a better job of those um, those gradations mm-hmm. than and Mass that's, Effect. And yeah. that's because, because they of the lack of voice. Everything. Exactly. But just it's more like what you want, Chris. Yeah. I think mm. KOTOR was more along those lines of yeah. what you want you I, want I, it I to I wouldn't be. disagree. Although, again... Mm-hmm. There's that thing where on the second playthrough when I'm trying to go for like pure Jedi or pure Sith, then I'm starting to steer away from the things that are my natural instinct and more toward this is what I, I need to be to get this. Well, ah, but in thing. KOTOR 2, you can go gray Jedi. It's true. And yeah, right. the dark and that's, side, that's, that's a good side thing, thing yeah, doesn't make move. much of a mechanical difference in the KOTOR game. Right. No, it does. True. Like, it true. does. Yeah. I you, mean, it can get, change. It can affect. You get different force powers. Yeah, but it's like. You can be a little bit dark side or a little bit light side, and it's not a big deal. Oh, that's true. You don't have to be a hundred percent, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. true. Whereas, but, but you do get different force powers depending on the it's way. Binary, you yeah. yeah, and yeah. actually, and, that's, and you can be gray and be, you know, just lean back or talk like wobble back and forth and yes. be totally fine. And that was actually one of the problems they had with Swotor was that they rewarded you for being heavily dark or heavily light, right. and it wasn't until later they even started talking about giving you better rewards for being neutral. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, any any karma based system is going to suffer from that mm-hmm. and, and have, you know, it's it's interesting when we talk about player choice and I'm loving this series. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm really looking forward to coming back to it again. Mm-hmm. Um if you give the same choice over and over and over, it's going to lose its meaning. And that may be what we're talking about here. I loved the Spider-Man game. I think it was Spider-Man 2, mm-hmm. right? The one that was in New York. Yeah. Uh, and, and and it was on the like GameCube or something 15 years ago. That was an excellent it was game. A great game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But how many little girls losing their balloons <laughs> in New York City do you have to do before you just go, okay, girl, listen, you're going to have to learn the Dietary hard way. Yeah. Balloons <laughs> float away. And if you can't hold on to your little balloon, I'm sorry. I need to go fight, you know, Mysterio. Yeah. So this is not my problem. Um, and then she turns into a supervillain. Yeah. Later, you know, um, <laughs> later in life, but, that's the but, Incredibles uh, crossover. Yeah. Right. That's, that's totally what that is. But, but I guess that's my point is, um, you know, there's, there's this sort of something iconic and beautiful and, and just mm, feels so good about Spider-Man saving a girl's balloon and giving it back to her the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The 75th time <laughs> you need something new. Yeah, yeah. And so what we're talking about here is, do you make it a mechanic? Do you make it, um, you know, natural? Is it one thing that happens in a cut scene? And I think we're at a point now in games, 15 years later after that example, where it's, it's like I said, you know, last week, games are too old now for us to allow these things to happen. Yeah. No, I, there's, there's no excuse anymore. I agree. And I think we're going to see um, the result of these 15 years because there is a new Spider-Man game coming. Mm-hmm. I believe oh, really? you've heard of. Yes. Yeah. It was announced. We might see more of it at Is it at based E3. on the Avengers or whatever? No. Okay. It is. Um, in fact, they even cited Spider-Man 2, these earlier open world Spider-Man games, nice. as the inspiration. Nice. Yeah. So it is very much a in the same vein type of game. Who was the studio again? Because I remember being intrigued by who was I doing it. I think it's Insomniac. But... To that point, mm-hmm. gamers are not going to put up with that in no, the new Spider-Man game of saving the little girl's balloon seventy-five times. We're not thirteen anymore, right? Well, but not but not just the that. The little girls have grown Thir- up and learned how to hold under their balloons. Yes, <laughs> we're going to become supervillains. Thirteen-year-olds are not going to put up with that either. I don't think. <laughs> no, I, agree. I think that that we have an expectation, especially we live in a, in a world back in back with Spider-Man Two when it came out. Um, we were on what GTA Three, maybe, maybe I like Vice so. City. The point is. Yeah, we we're we're in a world where we have game. We've had games like Red Dead Redemption Two yeah. and Grand Theft Auto Five. Yeah, we have and Witcher Three. We yeah. have these games that are these massive open world games that do so much in terms of what you can do and and the options that you have. Yeah, that that's your competition. Yeah. And if you cannot live up to that, don't make an open world game. I agree. Mm-hmm. Don't make one. I agree. We're not going to put up we're with not, the repeated yeah, elements anymore. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. And that might be a uh, hint as to uh, upcoming uh, episodes of the podcast. But for now, <laughs> I believe we're out of time. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode 103 of the backward-compatible.com podcast, our discussion on uh, the way the dialogue is presented in games and the way the player choice is communicated through the dialogue. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. I'm Nick. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com. 
and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.